Ready. Let's start the, the meeting. Uh, today we're going to be discussing the cemeteries. And uh, before we start, I'd like to, uh, I don't know, Leaf uh, is a town historian. And do uh, you know everybody here, Leaf? Yeah, I've had you know? everybody either at a meeting or you know, in one place. So you don't need to have anybody to introduce me to what's going around. Okay, now I asked Leaf to uh, come and make a presentation on cemeteries because he's uh, you know heavily involved in that naturally as a historian. And so I'll turn it over to if there's any questions to begin with before I turn it over to Leaf so he can explain uh, what uh, you know uh, he has to offer in regard to cemeteries. Okay, okay Leaf. Okay, so <clears throat> I think the document is fairly self-explanatory. Um, Doug did most of the digging and research on the plan uh, to come up with the framework <clears throat> based on other communities that have a similar committee. Okay, so I guess that's the background of how we arrived at, at the resolution. Is but there a committee you, now? Was that, is there a committee now? No. And that's what I'll, let me, I'll, okay. I'll go there because I think that's really more what you need the background. Um, so as you know, you know, we used to have cemetery association and all that sort of stuff. And since that was dissolved and the town assumed responsibility for interments and academy and, and the maintenance and upkeep of our historic burial grounds, um, it's, it's kind of farmed out. So Ray in the past, as you all know, did a lot of work on Hun Cemetery. And Lindsay's office of Parks and Rec before she got here has always historically, you know, kind of taken care of the mowing and maintenance, that kind of thing. So there hasn't been anybody that it's really our cemeteries have fallen. The responsibility falls on one group or individual. And I think probably that's the, the heart of the matter is that our cemeteries are very old. And then everything I say. I say about um, the cemeteries that are closed. Academy is kind of another, it's a, it's a piece of the conversation, but it's not the, the reason that I want to put this resolution together and form a committee. Because Gene manages uh, the ongoing interments at Academy. So the other cemeteries. Is Academy the corner of Seneca Point and Westlake Road? Correct. Okay. Yeah. How many are there? Eight altogether. Okay. And now I got to go up and count my binders, but they, they, I believe my eight, Doug, if you remember better than me, that includes Wolverton, which is landlocked uh, on private property. We're allowed to kind of go in and get. So is that the one that you got? Yep. Would you explain where each of them are? Or... Yes, yeah, so we've got sand, and, and I'm going to refer to the ones that are. We have one on New Michigan, we have one on Cooley, we have Sand Hill, um, we have Lucas up on Route 21, we have Hun, uh, and we have Not Road. I think I got them all. They vary in, um, obviously, in size. I think you probably all drew or not by every one of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. You maybe just see it, maybe you don't, you know, maybe just kind of there. Um, I think Hun is the most visible one. Hun does contain the largest number of uh, the oldest of our burials. That makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. So, um, and it's other than Sand Hill, I would say it is the most visible of our cemeteries. Lucas is <clears throat> Lucas would be because it's on Route Twenty One, just south of. Uh, of Cheshire. However, it the way it's kind of tucked uh, back into the trees, I think most people don't really, you know, they kind of flash by it. Uh, they, as I said, sort of say though, they're, they vary in age, they vary in the number of interments, you know, from uh, over 100 to just a few. Cooley Road is tiny, and there's not a lot that anybody can do for Cooley Road except keep it moved. You know, keep the sign fresh. But what we've got is uh, a lot of degradation of our headstones, and we have ongoing problems with mowing contracts. Um, <clears throat> Doug and Lindsay had to deal with our um, our contractor this summer. 
they uh, unintentionally, I'm sure, uh, damaged a headstone in Hun Cemetery. And this is kind of a, uh, could it be an ongoing problem? The stones are very fragile. Um, the oldest ones are made from a material called bluestone. We all call it sleep. That's a specific kind of sleep. And those are the, the headstones that date to the 1790s. The next most common material is marble. And our marble, marble is a metamorphic rock. Uh, it evolves from limestone. We, most of the, the marble headstones in the Northeastern United States were mined in, it's mined in uh, uh, New Hampshire. It started in uh, around 1800, they started mining and shipping it all over the country, all over the Eastern United States. Not all of that marble was stable. Some of it was still more limestone than marble. Uh, what's happened is it melts. It would melt without acid rain. We all grew up, you know, acid rain, acid rain, acid rain. And that did degrade a lot of public monuments. And they're literally melting. So we have different issues with our headstones and kind of maintaining them. And the reason why do we want to maintain them? I think that's another thing I should address. Why, why does it matter? You know, we're talking, you know, less than a thousand old dead people have been on the ground for 200 years. Nobody really, you know, is important. None of them were national figures. Um, what I would point out is that these are the oldest public monuments that we have. And when I say monuments, I include buildings, okay? They are a form of a monument. There is nothing older in Canada with those headstones. There are a few churches and public buildings that fall into the early 19th century. And I'm thinking, and I'm not talking about Canandaigua town of, I'm just talking about historic Canandaigua, which was then what we call the city and the town. So separating us out from the city, they're certainly the oldest thing we have. And there's also a lot of data and a lot of information that's stored on those stones, both uh, in form of uh, <coughs> geological data, but there's also um, a lot of it. Historic data. And I'll give you a quick example. There's a stone that toppled over in the Hun Cemetery, broken into. It's a, it was a blue slate stone. Yay long. It's in two sections now. It belonged to Olive Hun. Olive is the um, daughter in law of Zadok Hun, who is, Reverend Zadok Hun is one of the earliest founders of Karen Day. If you live on the west side of town, over in the Bristol neighborhood. He's the guy that, you know, really uh, uh, kind of organized that whole segment of the community. Now, Zadok is recognized as one of our key founders. So this is one of his family members, it's in his plot. And the stone has some unusual markings that were below grade. And it's actually the price of the headstone it was scratched into the slate. And, it, and the price changed too, because this is kind of amusing to me. The, the dollar sign and the amount next to it changed. So I don't know if that reflects the fact that they were adding tax to the price went up or, you know, but something something changed with that. But there's all kinds of information that's contained in those stones. And those stones are very similar to stones that are found in New England, um, in Boston, Lexington, Concord area because that's where a lot of our settlers came from, was from Connecticut and Massachusetts. Some from uh, Eastern New York, but most of our um, early families came from Connecticut and Mass. And they brought with them their forms and designs, not only for their barns and their, their uh, houses, but for their headstones. I've been working with the Bristol Town historian um, because we have some commonalities between their burial ground on Route 64 and our burial ground on Route so I, I'm going to ask you to just kind of take it on faith from me that they're valuable to our community, to the future of our community. We'll just operate on that premise. So assuming that I'm right, there's far more than your town historian can do to maintain and preserve those headstones. Um, I spent 
two hours just getting started on repairing our pond's headset. Uh, that was cleaning it and using uh, a headstone repair resin to glue the fragments back onto the face of it. And there are literally hundreds of headstones that we that need some kind of repair. Some of it's simple, a lot more simple than olives. Some of it will be as complex as olives. Without that repair, those headstones are gone. In a couple of years, a lot of them will just be a pile of slag. Olives, um, because it was laying on the ground, uh, was at risk from the mowers. Fortunately, Mother Nature did its damage, toppled it over, it broke. Um, and the mowers have not driven over it yet. And this, this, is, this happens a lot. The face of the stone delaminates. Uh, bluestone is kind of like a sheet of plywood. It's been left out in the rain. And it'll, it'll slough off. And if any of you want to see, I can show you some fragments in my office. And then what happens is, you know, we get mowers that are trying to get that job done quickly. And they don't really worry too much about that stuff that's laying on the grass. They just need to mower it. And when you get a zero turn mower and you pivot around, you whack a stone on it again. So we're up against Mother Nature. We're fighting, uh, you know, poor mowing practices. And, and I don't think there's a lot we can do about that except keep a wary eye on our mowing contracts. And Again, that is why you want a committee. You want eyes on those cemeteries. You want to disperse the workload you know, across more than just parks and rec and occasional <clears throat> visits by the town historian. Because like I said, there are eight of them and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stones and burials. Um, could Academy and its ongoing interments come under that committee? Absolutely. Um, a lot of towns, you know, Doug did the, the research, thank God. Um, other towns have cemetery committees for just this reason, because so many of the associations have failed um, and it's fallen to the, to the towns. So I hope I, I've kind of sketched out why it, we need it um, and why it's important. And I, because I could really bore you guys to tears. I don't mean to, but I could talk endlessly about headstones and history and, and all that kind of stuff. I don't, I have written a couple of articles recently um, that appeared in the Messenger, and I'll just say this. I wrote one about the Civil War and about some fellas from down in the academy uh, section of the town that fought and died in the Civil War. That um, research began because of our cemeteries. I would not have known who these guys were or what they did had it not been for their headstones. It was looking at the headstones, looking at the names, going, ah, that's kind of odd. There were two boys named Housel. And there was some confusion in our records. And my kind of like just scratching away. Well, you know, it wasn't like I did some amazing thing. I just asked a couple questions and it started to unravel the story of these, these young men. That's what our headstones do for a lot of people who are doing genealogical research, historic research. It fills in blanks. It provides um, a basis for a question to be asked. Um, and, you know, I guess think of these people and also as you're considering all of this, think of them as your mom and dad. I mean, yes, they're your great great grandparents. But someday it's going to be our moms and dads. And if I don't give a damn about these gravestones, and if I don't set a, a kind of a policy and a trend of good stewardship, why are our kids and grandkids going to give a damn 30 years from now? And I think we have a lot of, a lot of room for improvement in that area. Questions? Lee, one of the questions I have is, and I probably should know, but I don't. In, are, is there any uh, room in any of these cemeteries for like people who have ancestors already in there would like to be buried there? No, except academy. Just academy. Uh, yeah. There are some people, there aren't many plots left in the academy or 
Yeah, not people a lot. That can. I think there are people that are alive at old blocks. Yes. Still, but not exactly. Alive. I want to say there's like yeah. a gene said there might be like 16 or something in that. Yeah, neighborhood. Right there. And if, Doug, do you recall anybody yeah. mentioning a number? There's about that. We don't sell uh, new uh, plots. And so it's the the ownership of the existing plots that uh, when we took it you know, over, we when we took over, there are people who yeah. the books. Then. So Leaf mentioned the eight that the town of Canandaigua uh, directly is responsible for. There's a ninth one in the town of Canandaigua, which is Pine Bank, and we contract them with Pine Bank. So that's an association. They still are open. They still uh, sell plots. They still have a lot of room to expand. Uh, we do contract with them for services so that um, we can help them financially stay afloat, essentially, uh, to yeah, hopefully true. keep it from being turned over to the town. But that is the only association left in the town of Canandaigua. So they, they manage do a really nice job. They, they right. manage the process, is so what you're saying? Artists? Yeah, so they're an association. Both so they the own the land, uh, both sides of the road uh, <laughs> there, and then they sell. Uh, sites they still sell plots uh, and then they still do impairments and everything at Pine Bank. Okay. Are they the only cemetery that is actively accepting new plots? Yes. yes. In the town of Canada. They're across um, both Curtis Road, also yeah. they're on both sides. Both sides. Yeah. They look like they have a lot of room on the mm -hmm. north they side. Do. They do. And, and they, they are meticulous. It, mm -hmm. It's very pretty. It's yeah. I mean, if somebody's looking, you know, for a plot and lives in our town, it's a wonderful, you know, cemetery. It's very well so there are the eight cemeteries that the town's responsible for have no endowments. There is, we, it, we, so there is a, a, a budget line, and Shauna or Doug, bail me out if I say this wrong. So we have a budget line that is for repair and maintenance. What is that okay. budget? Of our headstone. A couple thousand. A couple thousand? Yeah. It, I would say like 25 or 2,800, Doug. Does that seem right? Yeah. Per, I'll look it up. I'll per year. Sure, but yeah. now, That's OK. Just a, used, approximately is all I need. So it's not big money. money. OK, no. And, and so we didn't use it for a couple of years. And we started to have serious degradation in the Hun Cemetery. So there's a lot, to, again, I told you there's a lot. This is a very, it's a topic that there's a lot of information on, okay? Most of the information isn't good information. In other words, it's bad news. So because of the nature of those stones, if they are not maintained on a regular basis, and by regular, annual, annual surveys to go, okay, that stone's good, this one needs repair, okay? If we're not doing that, Mother Nature has her way really quick. Two, what happens with the, I'm sorry? Two or three grand is not going to no, put it, put it down. No, it won't. So. No, it won't. We, we will always be fighting an uphill battle that we'll lose. Okay. Yes. Well, just so everybody's aware. So the town of Canada, well, we actually do have a capital improvement plan and cemeteries are included in the capital improvement plan. And in the past, what has happened is uh, the amount that has been uh, requested by the town historian has been relatively small. The biggest capital expenditure that we had, I would say, in the last five years was the planned improvements for the new fence at Hun Cemetery. Uh, otherwise, they were very small amounts. So one of the things that with LEAF starting is, you know, any type of things that he's identified need to become part of the capital plan. Uh, as we get into the new year, we'll have to update the capital plan anyway with any number of things. And then, you know, the things that LEAF has identified will have to go into that capital plan. And then we have to budget for it, just like we do snow plows or parks or anything else. And, and it, it seems the staff help prepare a budget, a proposed budget for this, um, that will address a lot of it. It won't, will it, it, it won't fix everything. I'm sorry, John, you started to ask something. I no, I, I apologize. I might have interrupted you. Um, but either way, okay. I've got a few questions. But um, it seems to me that we have two issues, maybe three issues that are before us to discuss. One appears to be the uh, whether we have the adequate allocation of funds available to maintain the cemeteries. <clears throat> That's one issue that I think is being 
presented by you very strongly, which I think is above and beyond the purview of this committee. The second question that comes to my mind is once that budget is or is not established is whether it's necessary to have a committee to manage the process or not. And that's my question is, why do we need a committee to manage the maintenance of the cemeteries, if that's what we're talking about? Okay, I can address that. So, and, and that you did, I mean, that is a really great summation. Um, let, me take, let me kind of just address the budget thing quick and I'll come back to the committee. Um, so all of this sprang out of, you know, my feeling of, of inadequacy, okay? It's town and story. It's just one guy can't do it, right? So is, is this proposal, is this committee the only way to manage the problem? Probably not. There's probably other ways to manage it. I mean, you could hire somebody on staff, um, you know, included either in an existing staff position or bring somebody. May I, may I address that point before you move off it? This ordinance says that the purpose of this committee is to govern the operation and maintenance. And to me, I have to ask the question, why do we need a committee to manage the operation and maintenance of okay. the cemetery? That's that's the essence of my question. Okay. Because that's what it says right here. So I guess what I'm trying to say when I say this, John, is I'm, um, I'm open to whatever... As historian, my, my gravest concern is that we do something that we don't allow this uh, situation to get worse, um, that we make a plan for the future, um, that we pass it off to future generations, you know, in good shape. I, I would guess that you probably had the full support of the this committee in that regard. I, th I think <laughs> the community... In, Am I right or wrong? I mean, does anybody disagree with that? I mean... We, we probably all agree that the importance of uh, maintaining the status quo of the existing cemeteries. I'm, I'm sure we all agree to that. Yep. So the question now is how do we do So how, do, why do I think, a and that's where I want to go. So why do I think a committee is, is the right way to go? Um, so when I said we need eyes on, we need to have annual and examinations of each cemetery, and we should probably be broken down the ideal way to do that would be quarterly, you know. Um, and it needs to be, it needs to be not tacked on as, oh, and you have this duty as well. You can go keep an eye on our cemeteries. I think that's, I don't think that's a good way of addressing it. So passing it off as a, you know, an, an added duty to an existing staff position probably is not the ideal way. That just is going to give somebody else more work, less time it's not going to get the diligence that it deserves. The reason I default to a committee is because we used to manage our um, cemeteries with associations and they did those functions, you know, they performed all those functions. Um, I think it's, is it something that I think because it's uh, in the public interest that should be Where the stewardship should fall, you know, on on volunteers, I do. I think that's a good way of managing a problem like this, and having solutions that make sense, um, and managing budgets in a way that makes sense. This is, and and, and then let me so come back to the budget part of it. Um, this problem, and probably some of you have heard, you know, <clears throat> my thoughts on this trickle around, you know. So Leaf's gonna tell you, you could probably spend $100,000 fixing our cemeteries. And it wouldn't like give you golden gates, okay? That would just be getting it straight. Um, and there are some good reasons to spend that kind of money. And there are some good results that would come from it that would be very long-term. So it would be a, a kind of a wise expenditure, all right? Good investment. But that's not my job, okay? My job is to advise you on why something is historically important. And in this particular case, I think not only advise you on why it's historically important, but why I would urge this committee 
to uh, put their weight behind solutions like a committee that will take responsibility and provide the authority to continue to maintain those cemeteries over the long term. And I think there's less room for slippage with a committee. That's my mm -hmm. strong feeling. There gets to be a lot of slippage when we add, if, if, and I'm just gonna pick on Sean because she's sitting there. You know, if somebody said, hey, Sean, guess what? You're gonna, you're gonna have this too. And Doug's gonna be like, really? Um, the staff already has enough work to do. And now this person that I rely on to do this thing is suddenly got more on their plate and they're spreading themselves thin. So I think that's also a kind of a, a recipe for lots of little mistakes and disasters. You know, because it's not just going to, that wouldn't just be reflected in, you know, necessarily failure to, to do a good job for the cemeteries. It might be reflected in that person's other job performance. You know, if they're if they are actually trying to, to do the cemeteries, so I don't think a staff position yeah, addresses let me it. In, let me jump in here for a couple seconds. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a few things that just you guys should know. You guys are all questions. Number one, last year's budget for cemeteries contractual was eleven thousand dollars. The twenty twenty two budget is twenty one thousand. The twenty twenty budget was eight thousand, and the twenty nineteen budget was twelve thousand. But in that are all kinds of different things like burial costs for academy, the um, actually the money for uh, headstone repair, the money for Pine Bank Cemetery, money requested by the history team, for instance. So like, as an example, the history team, which is actually the original. So we had two things uh, four or five years ago. We actually created a committee, what I would say loosely that were residents that were passionate about cemeteries that lived near cemeteries that wanted to help keep an eye on for us. And they would constantly call us and just update us when things are going on. A great example of that is Larry Fox, former town board member. He's very, very passionate about Academy Cemetery. So when something's happening at Academy, he would call us, he would be like, hey, the flagpole really needs to be replaced or, or installed. There was no flagpole or, hey, this the wind knocked over tombstones because the wind knocks over these especially these bigger tombstones and everything else so that was that was fine because we were using the history team but really our history team has really developed more into documenting the overall history from an educational perspective of the community and less on the cemeteries themselves to what to what uh, uh he was saying so what you know so leaf's absolutely right there's there's a piece of that and, and staff is not the right way to do that uh, but there's a piece of that that's telling the education or the the reason why we have the cemeteries which mm -hmm. the history team can certainly work on that piece of it but some of it is i mean i met recently with the pine bank cemetery about this contract they literally take the solution and toothbrushes and go out and clean the tombstones we're not paying somebody to go out and clean a tombstone. That was a committee that did that, you're saying? Yeah, that's the other association, right? So where we could have a committee of volunteers <clears throat> to do that type of stuff and get much more involved in all of that type of maintenance and have them have some semblance of ownership where they feel important and part of that process and everything. The other thing I just share with you is there's nothing in the code currently, the town code about cemeteries. That was the thing that scared me, truthfully, when I started first talking to Leaf about this, about the creation of the committee and everything, is there's nothing in there. So somebody goes and does something in one of our cemeteries, if they want to have a demonstration and they want to protest burials or whatever they want to do, they can do that. There's nothing in our code at all. It's the wild, wild west mm -hmm. in terms Isn't of cemeteries. There a state regulation that makes that the town responsible, however. In, yes, we're responsible, but there's nothing in our code that says, that says how or can or even can or can't do. So that's what this does. This includes provisions on what's acceptable or not acceptable. To that point, I have to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Some of the rules and regulations that I see in here are written almost as if we are still accepting burials in some of the cemeteries. Mm -hmm. So why why do we need that help me understand because that a bit. because and specifically i did a lot of research on on what different municipalities are doing and not doing we are still accepting an academy i can see the day and so can pine bank when we end up with pine bank 
the entire board of directors of Pine Bank Cemetery is 75 plus. And if you're going to have a, it's a hundred, almost 200 acre cemetery that only 10% of it is full, we got to do something with it. Okay. So that helps understand. And, and I think everything you did, did, Doug pulled from other communities and the thoughts that went into this were plan for the future, plan for the future, plan for the future. And, and to what Doug was saying about, you know, we got volunteers out cleaning, you know, headstones at Pine Bank. You know, so I was fixing a headstone in Hum. I can't do that unless you guys want to establish a position for the town that is just the headstone fixer guy. Okay. And then I'll stop being the town historian. And, and by the way, while I'm doing that, you're still going to have to pay Peter Ellison, to, who is has done our restoration. I think you guys, is everybody familiar with Peter? Okay, so Peter has been hired for probably a long time. A long time, yeah, like close years, to 10 years. Yeah, 10 or longer. Um, Peter has his master's in architectural preservation. He works as a volunteer fireman, or a professional fireman, excuse me. And uh, so we we pay him to come into Hun and repair those headstones. By the way, while he's doing that, we're not getting Lucas, we're not getting Matt Road, we're not getting Sand Hill. Sand Hill's in pretty good shape, but there are things there that need tending. So it, we're, we're falling behind even with a pro and part-time volunteers, okay? So the problem is just so big um, that unless we start like accepting the responsibility of we got eight cemeteries, we're always gonna be behind. You know, we're just not going to get ahead of this um, without more um, human resources applied to the to the problem. And I think a committee could do that. How many of these uh, cemeteries are on private property? How many are? Yeah, one. Just one. Only one. Yeah, just one. Yeah. And there's yep. John. That's John's the lucky one. Yep. I'm the lucky guy. Yeah. And John, John's <laughs> wife wants to be more. Look at it. I still haven't gotten there, and that was John the what? Yeah. Four months ago, John. Three months ago, that. I think I talked with her, and so that that avoids the conflict of going on the private property to maintain property and all that. Unless John's out there with a shotgun. Right. Well, we do have one that's landlocked. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, they, and 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 I think that we got to talk about that. Yeah, so, that yeah. so there's this a, is why you need to that point. There's an issue relative oh, yeah. to that. You know, I mean, um, I would say. Our property is pretty actively hunted, uh, mostly by those that are not allowed to hunt there. Yeah. Um, so I think there's some risk aspect of that. So, and, and, and John, you, you know, Nat, I, are you familiar with the Nat Road one? Uh, Which is I, called Runnington Road. You know, yeah. I know I've probably driven by it, and I know where it is, and I've probably seen it, mm -hmm. and I can't off the think we all have it. Because yeah. I've lived here forever, too, right? And it, and it wasn't until I became town story that it went, well, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, So it sits off the road. Okay. And that's on public property. That the town it is public, yeah. but as yeah. Doug said, it's landlocked. Yeah. And so what I want you to cogitate on is this. Landlocked by private lands. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have a, by we, multiple private you know, property no, owners. No right away yeah, to it. We, it, one of the landowners give us gives us access down his driveway, and it's and it's only for uh, town employees. Mm -hmm. So, do we have a responsibility? And this is an old cemetery mm -hmm. um, with a lot of early burials, including some Revolutionary War veterans. So, um, and this is why I I really want to see a committee because the town historian doesn't want to deal with us. Okay, and you certainly don't. What? How do you? What do you? How do you prioritize that? The well, public can't get at it. The public is in, can hardly see it, yes. but we own it. We have a, we have a, what's our stewardship? What, what's our responsibility mm -hmm. to the future and to the past? And, and I'm gonna tell you that needs a group of people to sit around a table and discuss that at length because you're gonna spend money on it or you're gonna let it fall apart. And the history team also take this in. Um, I would say this about the history team. They have the same problem that the Pine Bank Cemetery Association has, okay? That a lot of our communities are facing. Members that are aging out. 
Okay. Um, somebody asked me to. We have, uh, a, we have a state with that problem. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. So when when I'm the young guy in the room, you're looking at ten. And I think I've talked to a couple of you guys about this. Right, Jerry? I'm the young guy in the room. That's a holy crap moment. Okay. Because I'm even up on sixty, and I'm the young guy. So uh, I think it's also, Terry, to answer your question, though, it's also passion, right? I think a lot of the history team members are passionate about telling history and education and history versus, like, I'll use the example again of Larry Fox. He's passionate about specifically Academy Cemetery, right? So there is a, there is a difference there. Yeah. And so Broader it's to plug into people's passions. It, it, there's, there's a physical limitation of, the, of what the members can do. I don't think we they need one more thing on their plate. They've got a lot of projects. And if they're also responsible for eight cemeteries, they're gonna to have to put all those projects down. And those projects that Barrel Grant, okay, that we just got, 15,000, right, Doug? The history team is administering a lot of that, okay? They're, they're deeply involved in that survey. Um, you know, they, they have worked diligently on Academy Cemetery. Uh, Rich and Donna West that work very hard on that. Um, there's walking tours they're working on. Okay. <clears throat> if they had eight cemeteries, they'd either do it badly and nothing else would get done. Right. It just our town has a great deal of history. And like a lot of towns, um, we've been busy growing, we've been busy living our lives. And we drive by the history and take it for granted. Well. You know, ultimately, you end up with, you know, where we're at right now. Oh, wait a minute. We need to take care of that. And in Canadagua, um, you know, we've got we're essentially two townships in scale. And it like, gives us just a lot of geography, a lot of history. And I think we've got a lot of, I'm, you, you all probably are aware that I'm nosing around this Futterman Cottage down on uh, Westlake Road. Um, I'm writing articles um, to try to keep people engaged with our history. So I, I, I would like to do more because there's more to do. There's an awful lot of history in our town and those cemeteries are just one big chunk of it and they deserve more than the history team or I can give them. Have people expressed any interest in joining the committee president? I or have only like very gently nose around that Terry, because yes, there are people who would be interested, and, and there are people well, we, I would like to have a list of nine people that were previously interested in kind of just helping keep an eye on cemeteries. Mr. Us. Fox would probably nine, be an ideal nine, nine, person. Nine, no, oh, nine, nine, nine people. Mm -hmm. Larry, I, one of them, of course, Larry, yes, he. Right. Well, oh, well, a lot of them are true for you. Yeah. Now, are there uh, grants available to help out with some of the maintenance and stuff uh, on these cemeteries or not? Well, I mean, there are some grants. It depends on what you're doing. I mean, that's like, so the borough architecture grant or the borough architecture company, the, the reconnaissance uh, survey that we mentioned, I mean, yes, that's, we got one grant. We did phase one. We identified all the historic properties, right? We had that big presentation down in Cheshire, what, under, 50 whatever people showed up for that and then this is the second phase getting more in depth of that so if there are grants but i can tell you it, that becomes a challenge in and of itself because you've got to have you can't just go always chasing grants you've got to identify what the problem is first and then see if there's a grant to help fix that because otherwise you're chasing your tail well, a lot of this is physical reconstruction and maintenance to prevent degradation and well, even things like putting in the flags on Fourth of July or Memorial Day, and then picking those up again, and, and even just all that type of yep. stuff, and even developing a policy about right. that. Right. Like Ray used to go get them immediately after Memorial Day. Well, Leaf's Leaf's theory was no, we're leaving it through July. Act, we're leaving it until um, uh, Labor Day, because people like to see it. Okay, that's just my way of going. A committee might be like, no, we want to establish a policy. Oh, by the way, there's a policy about lighting flagpoles. Okay, we have flagpoles that are not lit. We have flagpoles that need work. Um, I would kind of use this committee as a, um, an example too. So we have an ordinance committee because long ago we said 
the town board can't do everything. You know, there's just too much work, right? So we established other committees to to um, farm that work out and bring it back to the, to the town board. I think this is an example. I don't like growing government in small towns. I don't think we any of us is like yes, let's let's do more. But there are times when I think the answer, you know, this is the wise answer is somebody needs to take responsibility for this particular part of our community. And I think that's my argument. This is a big problem. It's going to be an ongoing problem. It does require financial and human resources. I can't do it. You can't do it. The history team can't do it. It needs a dedicated answer. What's the city do? Do they have anything like this leap? Or, I don't you know. know. I'm going to be very honest here. I mean, they have some. They got Pioneer, team. right? They got Woodlawn, right? Yeah. They've got. Um, and some obviously, Woodlawn is a separate. I mean, Woodlawn is its own separate association. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, and they are uh, just down the street here. Western. You know, so Pioneer Cemetery. Yeah. yeah. So they do a lot of maintenance and stuff. They have a group. They have a group that yeah. helps them and everything. I don't know if it's an official committee or not, but they have a group. But then the uh, they're basically their park staff does the work. Mm. And the Sons of American Revolution and the DAR have been involved with Hun, not so much with Not, though I think if we had access to Not, they would probably like to do something, even if it was just a private ceremony at Not Road. Um, there are people and organizations that would want to be involved with this. They have a vested interest in either the, the people that are interred there, specific people, or kind of play in Hun's sake, uh, case, they kind of the whole cemetery. Is some of the work that would need to be done, Lee, could, you know, and we hire seasonal employees, you know, I mean, train to do some of this work oh, yeah. during the summer for, a, we hire people to be lifeguards and such to, you know, to help get some of the maybe simpler things done and that's the complex. Yes. I, so like, that, that's what I'm doing, Terry. Like, I'm, I'm not going to like the jobs that Peter, Putting some of these uh, headstones back together is it's like a vertical jigsaw puzzle. Um, and he's very skilled at it. The one I did is a horizontal jigsaw puzzle. So it's a little easier. You know, um, that kind of the stuff I'm doing, yeah, you could train volunteers to do that or summer staff to do that. Um, I think that's what that committee needs to um, address too is. You know, obviously, ways to mitigate cost mm -hmm. with volunteers. I kind of like the idea, and this is just something I hope the committee looks at. Is I kind of like the idea of having um, volunteers dedicated to each cemetery, who then come back to that committee and say, "Hey, you know, there's a there's a big limb that's laying across the the south uh, east corner of the Lucas Cemetery. We need to get that out of there." You know, and then the committee could, you know, come to Doug, come to to Jim and say, hey, you know, we need to get that out of there. Um, and that's realistically, that's kind of stuff that happens on a very regular basis in our cemeteries. Limbs, trees down, um, frost heaval. There's a uh, uh, obelisk at Sand Road, very, very pretty marble obelisk. And the frost has heaved it and it's kind of leaning and twisted, you know, it's off its uh, base, so to speak. And so those are the things that I think volunteers would be able to address. Um, and that, again, it comes back to the aging out thing. Yeah, I mean, we could have the committee members could be, uh, I don't care how old they are. Matter of fact, I think older is better, okay? Because I think they have a sense of the history in the cemetery. You know, they, they know from living in the community, the value of it. Um, I think we've all <laughs> they get kids. involved though. We've learned more. You know, and, and even as a town, right, we've got more uh, input from more diversity of different sources. And like, for instance, three years ago, when it comes to cemeteries, we'd go pick up a limb when it fell down. That was it. Now we have a tree team that they've gone through all of our parks and all of our cemeteries. And they marked earlier this year all the trees that have got to come out because they're either dead or dying. And right now we're just waiting for the ground to freeze to be able to get in and do it without tearing up the, the cemetery, you know? So 
um, I think we've also evolved too. We, we've learned, we're Is, learning. Edith had that tree team, you know, or is she on it? She's on it. She's on it. She's yeah. on it. We've got, uh, we've got, uh, I think three certified arborists on that tree team. So, and, and I throw this out just, and I don't even know if I've talked to you about it. So the, the Hun Cemetery has three gigantic oaks. Are you all familiar with the oak that's in the front of the VA that has the plaque on it? Mm -hmm. yep. And they estimate that, that that tree was a seedling in 1790. There are two oaks in Hung Cemetery that are probably that old. And that's something we want to do too, is we're, we're going to get to try to get the tree team out to age it. Um, the Arbor, Arbor, National Arbor Day Foundation has a way of listing um, historic trees. Um, there's a suspect American elm up at Lucas Cemetery. Um, you know, if that's if it's if it is an American elm, we want to kind of keep an eye on it. Yeah. There's um, a pine tree that's probably the biggest pine tree I've ever seen in my life down at Academy. Academy, yeah. Huge. And and the root system just growing out. Like, yeah. I, I, there's probably a couple of literally a couple of graves under that tree now. Yeah, probably. Um, so there's there and then. Uh, last thing I would add about like the, the physical um, physical description of what's going on with some of our cemeteries, Hun and Lucas. Um, when we started mechanical mowing back in the day, uh, getting the the mowers down between the headstones and the footstones was uh, problematic. So they pulled the footstones and threw them in the weeds. And I don't know if you're all aware, but in cemetery, um, everybody faces west. Okay. Because on the final day of judgment, the sun will rise in the west. Okay. And everybody was interred so that they would see the rising sun and the second coming. Okay. So that was the Christian belief when we established our burial grounds. Um, they all also had a footstone, or nearly all. I mean, it's not safe to say all. Most graves had a footstone. And mechanical mowing made those. Just a pain in the neck. I have uncovered eight footstones, and there are 13 more footstones in the hedgerow on town property at Hun Cemetery. Um, some of them go back to the very early 19th century. They are over 200 years old. <clears throat> and uh, one of them was for, if you, when you go back upstairs, if you look in the case um, where I've got the, the headstones, you'll see one that says um, JFH, Jemima Fanna Hahn. Yes. She is the daughter of Zadok. She died in 1801, so 220 years old. That was laying in the weeds. Okay. Um, this was done when our dads were young men. Okay, when we, the, the cemeteries that didn't get abandoned um, and left to grow, you know, up into weeds, um, ones that were maintained, when they started power mowing, instead of sending a kid out there with a real dick, with a real mower, you know, um, they pulled those footstones. So it's, it, it, there's, it's not a neglect thing, it's just a thing that happened, and it happened everywhere. It happened all over the country. But here are these wonderful old um, footstones that were, you know, match the headstone. Um, we can't reestablish them uh, because it would create a problem for mowing now. However, I would like to actually reestablish them in um, a section of Hun where it would be like a footstone garden. Um, we have a lot of holes in Hun Cemetery that result from gravestone degradation. Um, you can see the depression of the grave, but there's no stone associated with it. You, any of you that have been there, you'll go along, you'll see the gorgeous rope. There's a big gap in it. Mm. No, that was filled at one time. No, mm. We just don't have a stone marker there anymore. And we don't have records of who those people were. A lot of the records are gone. Um, so there, there is a lot. There's a lot of work for that committee to do. Do you get any uh, contact or communication from descendants of any of the people in the cemeteries? I haven't um, lately, but people will go there frequently, especially to Hong, um, yeah. to look up somebody. Um, I think they should be your first candidates if they live in the town. 
I would tell you the coach, though, right before COVID, I think it's been less since then, but leading right up until COVID, we were getting probably, I would say on average, a half a dozen a year families would contact us because they wanted to upgrade or replace or make improvements to the tombstone of somebody that's in the town. So we're regular, but I mean, they were coming from all over the country. I mean, I remember one lady came from California to come here to then see that actual grave. Yeah. Right. yeah. And so I, find a grave has changed that a little. If you're not familiar with find a grave, you can go online and it's, it's like, a volunteer. Like ancestry, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a database find that we all yeah. contribute to as well. I, again, I used that in that article on uh, the household boys from Academy that fought in the Civil War. That find a grave and our cemeteries, boy, you, you really can. You can just get so much information. Um, but that does change the inquiry process because mm -hmm. a lot of times people will find it and now they don't have to call the town. They can just jet to wherever that, group, that cemetery is and if it's on public property and do their thing, you know, go take pictures. Right. Do whatever it is they want to do. Well, um, the reason to have regulations such as this is doing their thing, make sure it's done properly. And yep, and, uh, absolutely. Respect, and yeah. fun. You all got better things to do, but I'm going to tell you real quick. I got, I, I have plans for Han. If I, if this committee forms, and I can twist their arm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Han is a, it's almost like an outdoor museum, and the work that Ray. And the DAR, SAR, Doug, everybody did, okay? Our town and the volunteers with the fence, with the flagpole, with the bench, okay? It's a really special little place. And it's on a highly trafficked route. And I think you're all familiar with the fact that that's also the route of Sullivan's March. And some of those men were on Sullivan's campaign, okay? And I'd love to give a, a, a long lecture on Sullivan's campaign. <laughs> But so it sits, you have historic graves sitting on a historic road, and it is an exceptionally nice spot, and I would like to see it developed as uh, an outdoor museum, and that would sort of make it an adjunct to our parks and recreation. They wouldn't have to worry about, you know, the maintaining of the, the cemetery committee would do that, um, but it would become an asset of the town. People pull over there a lot. It's a very attractive little spot, and... Uh, <laughs> Mr. Miller has the corner. I think you're all familiar with that corner on Woolhouse and, and County Road 32 where we, we have gravel stored. Yes. Um, Mr. Miller doesn't chase people off, which is kind of nice, but I see cars pull over there every day. They are using it for a texting spot. Mm -hmm. um, there are people that will pull over and just kind of relax next to the cemetery. Um, I think that that cemetery has tremendous potential within the town's recreation plan and um, in helping educate uh, our youth. So there is, there are other good things that could come from this beyond just maintaining gravestones. And I probably wasted way too much of your time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. John, I have to uh, leave by 10. And so uh, we, we did set up November 17th as a, you know, a second date for this month, and we can continue with cemeteries at that time if uh, you know, the committee is agreeable to that. Yeah, I like the concept. Uh, I think the biggest problem is going to be finding members. Uh, I mean, the way, we, you know, the town is currently with uh, trying to fill positions. Uh, but if you have people in mind, maybe that's something to go find the members first before you form the committee. Because, you know, why form a committee if you can't fill the slots? Um, but you got to advertise the committee. I mean, that's true. Well, that's what I've been waiting be. for. Because I don't want to ask, you don't want to get people revved up. Yeah. Thinking they're going to volunteer for something, they're going to make a difference. And they go, yeah, no, it's okay. Then you've maybe you know damaged them for another committee year. You know. And this well, isn't just committee though. I mean, there are there's no, no, that was my there's thing. budgetary considerations yeah. that you know, Doug. You, if you have a committee, you also have to have money. Right now, we, we're spending money on mowing maintenance. 
and and a headstone and a little bit of stabilization you know you've got maintenance you got stabilization we've got repair you know putting things up and together and then the his, the preservation of this historical data which may be lost if, if it isn't done and what's it worth to the town of Canandaigua or a commitment of people who care mm -hmm. and I don't know you can spend a hell of a lot of money here you can. It, it's a I, bottomless pit yes and yep, it's how creative if, you want if to I be. if I was I suggest that there are a lot of people that will say take a picture of the headstone and digitize it all and save it and let God's natural uh, progression degrade it and it'll go away. And many people don't even bother with burials anymore. Um, you know, the hi history will be- there, there are people that would give you that and, answer. And, and I mean, I have an answer for them, but well, you're right. But what's it that. worth to the town when you're setting up a budget and how many people care? I don't know, I've got, Four people that I can think of that are buried in the Academy Cemetery. My wife's family's got actually a cemetery in Hopewell that goes back into the 1700s, you know, Jebediahs and Ebenezer's and yep. it's in the back, <laughs> back of somebody's barn, but that's totally un, un, not maintained at all by Hopewell. So people ultimately don't care many people don't care that's and, correct. and when it's, it goes it's into what are you going to budget for as opposed to something some else don't know whether they should care they don't even know that there's anything to care about right you're right i i think the historical we're supposed value, to care though the historical value yeah and how do you preserve it maybe again and, is is do a rubbing or take a picture and when somebody calls up, oh, we got an index of where the Joneses or the Smiths or the Huns or the- We don't even have to do that. Yeah. Because yeah. find a grave's done. Yeah. They're all in find a grave. Pardon. We should have a herd of goats that we just moved from cemetery to cemetery <laughs> and there'd be no mechanical- yeah, well, you know, no That was one of the answers way back answer. in the day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, 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 this is a big, this could be an endless task. It could be a bottomless pit, I agree. And and that's, but then again, your committee has to be charged with good stewardship, just like every other committee is, you know. Um, do, do they have a right to say, hey, we, we want to spend 100,000 and spruce up? Yes, they probably would be wise to do that. And it would be wise in the budgeting process to say, well, okay, if you want to spend 100,000, but we're not going to be able to give you 100,000, you're going to have to go figure out where the hell your 100,000 is coming from, whether it's grants and donations or whatever. I don't think, I am not one of those people who thinks that you, you throw money at problems to make them go away. I think you, you throw people at problems, okay? You get human resources, you get community involvement to whatever extent you can. And it's not going to be perfect and it's not going to start out, you know, with this surge of, under 50s that are going, hey, let me go fix some headstones. That's just not realistic. But um, things can. Is, is the head, are the headstones the important thing or the data contained on them? Both. Okay. okay, because you have headstones that are an art form that's 200 years old and no longer mm -hmm. exists, okay? And it's pretty cool stuff. I would encourage you, you've been to the Hopewell one, stop at the Hun and actually look at the, the artwork and look at the language. Like there's a headstone for in Hopewell or down, sadly. Yeah. Um, Seth Holcomb Jr. was about two years old when he was interred in 1799. Seth Holcomb Sr. lost his two year old boy and buried him in Hun Cemetery. And you always hear, oh, you know, they were so much tougher and, uh, you know, they were inured to the you know loss of life bullcrap. 
And when you look at the headstones of children and babies, babies that didn't even live a day, and you look at the, the story that's sitting in front of you of the, of the love of the parents for that child. And this, this headstone for Seth, it looks like it was pulled out of the Lexington, Massachusetts burial ground. Okay. It's an old headstone. It's 230 years old and it's a lost art form. We don't make headstones like that anymore. Um, so there's art form, there's data, um, there is much to be learned. You're right, we could digitize. We could digitize everything in every museum too. We could digitize, we could take photographs of every major monument. All the monuments that were turned down, thrown away, we just take pictures of them and put them in a book and say, there you go. Okay, I don't think that's an adequate solution to future generations. And I think we are charged um, as leaders, today's leaders, with, with handing off something that's at least as good as we were given or back. Gary, it seems to me like we're um, going around the bush here. We're repeating ourselves over and over again. So the question becomes, uh, how do we move forward? What do we want to do? How do we get this thing? Um, well, could, I just want to, there are two parts to this, really, the cemetery committee and the historical aspect, but there's also the rules and regulations section in here. Mm -hmm. Go back to Doug's point that we don't really have anything that, you know, establishes a, you know, some kind of, here's what you can do, here's what you can't do. I don't know if it would make sense to separate the two or, or what, but how, I mean, how, the rules and regulations then. How many empty graves are there at Academy? How many empty graves? You mean, how many plots that still yeah. have to be filled? That's what we were saying, about 16. Yeah. Just shut it up. Hmm? Don't allow any more burials. Well, you can't. You the, can't other, the other thing, thing we bought them, people plot. already own them, so they have the right to be buried. You can't say no. Yeah. And the other thing that I would think already purchased them. Yeah. Is so we don't sell them. We don't. So no. the cost of lots and we, all that it really seems. So and well, and who sells that, 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 that association? Like that. Oh, that association yes. sells them. Yes. I think if you approve a committee, the committee can tweak a lot of this and work with Doug and Gene, but. Um, one of the things that you need to consider with like rules and regs and policies is we've got a lot of veteran graves. And that would, that would be another thing I would address with, why don't we just digitize? Well, try to explain to the, the veterans, you know, why we're not mowing that grave. And we have Revolutionary War veterans. So even if you're not a Revolutionary War history fan, um, there, are, there are dead guys in every one of those cemeteries who fought for their country. Gary, maybe it might be a good idea to, um, so you're gonna talk about this, it sounds like on the 17th. In the meantime, on the town website, there's actually a page on all the cemeteries and there's a report that Ray did that tells the history of each of the cemeteries. It's really interesting information. You get a good sense about the importance of all nine of the cemeteries. Well, that's on the all the committee members 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 look at that website. before the next meeting. If you, 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 way, you just okay. go to the website and type in cemetery in the top right corner in the mm -hmm. search bar, that's the easiest way to tell you how to find it. Because the least we need to do, I would think, is get some kind of regulations on the book so it would help out the town in, uh, in that regard. Any other questions before we adjourn for today? <laughs> I told you I could get waste a lot of your time with cemeteries. Yeah, <laughs> one thing is, there is one. Okay. I have a chapter. New chapter. New chapter. Actually, um, in the rules and regulations, Article 4, Section F, the burial of cremation ashes shall be done by the town. Yeah. Have I, we done that? Or we, <laughs> we got, got, got a post hole digger. I had a question mark on that, board. too. What a that? Yes, yeah, so we actually do the digging uh, at Academy for the burials. Um, we actually send a uh, backhoe down, whether it's parks or whether it's highway. Um, the, what, what I read is that a lot of municipalities require that the municipality actually do the burial of cremation so that they're not just scattering ashes around the cemetery in the wind. What difference does it make? <clears throat> 
that's a that's, I guess that's a policy decision, but I guess what I read was it's about it being buried and contained in the ground versus just I think the state red. even has some regs about I mean I know they do. Like you can do it on your own property, you can get away with a lot, but the, the Neptune Society years ago tried to loosen laws and regulations regarding burials and, and cremations. And that is not one where they were successful. I know you, I, I, I can't cite your chapter and verse. And I agree with you. But the hell difference does it make? I mean, come on. How's it any different than talk about dust to part, dust? That, that's yeah, couldn't do well, much you, better. Clearest we'll definition of it. Yeah. <laughs> but you talk about a back hole. If memory serves you right, both my uh, in laws were cremated, and the hole wasn't that big. Yeah. No, I say no, we no, currently do much to it. for <laughs> academy. We it's actually right. do do the internals. We actually go dig a hole. Well, you said the going down the back hole and stuff, and I we do. Uh, wow, we do at academy well, for, for, for a grade for, for, yeah, yeah, for a full yeah, grade, not for yeah, yeah, not for, for yeah. full grade. Okay, because this was under cremation. Uh, yeah. So I, I also have a. You know some questions about some of the bullets as we're going down through. Yeah. I guess which yeah, we, 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 we have a lot more Sometimes stuff gets in the uh, the uh, cost of lots and purchasing of lots, of, and then the maintenance is sort of mixed in with it. So it's sort of got to be consolidated, I think, into uh, articles that are specific to. Is there a rule about some kind of public health rule about vaults? Okay, I'm a historian. Now you're getting into <laughs> I think I could call the county and ask. Describe some because because some, somewhere in it talk, talks about, yeah. you know. Yeah, I think there's actually I think there's some state legislation that talks about it has to be buried in something. It's in there somewhere. I'll have to do So you can't they can't wrap them up in a sheet. No, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that I I do know that. Yes. Yeah, I mean public health issue. You would have to buy a vault, yes. It's the great it state of New York telling so you yep. freaking primitive. But... Crate, cradle to grave, man. Uh, hey, is everybody all set for today then? So we're meeting again on the 7th, 17th, right? I just want you to stick 